sure before you leave this room, you have registered your name. Don't forget to register. Uh, now, before I proceed, I think according to our timetable, it's the time for introduction. But uh, then after the introduction, uh, the dialogue we after the introduction, uh, I will welcome the THRC National Coordinator, Advocate Ones Molengrumo for the great and also the program shall proceed as scheduled. So I hope all of us here, we are students, except the members of the high table. Please, if you're a student, can you just raise up your hand? We want to see the groups of people who are here. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Members from the civil society organizations, can you raise up your hand in case you're here? Anyone from the civil society organizations? Okay. Advocates? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, journalists or any person from the media house, from any media house, thank you so much. I think you have received a pre-survey form, every one of you. Please, may you fill it and put it at the, either the left-hand side of your desk so that you can collect it. You have just like five minutes to fill it. Please do so. I hope everyone has received. Anyone who has not yet received the pre-survey form, I hope everyone, yes, I'm coming there. Now, uh, this dialogue will also be conducted online. We will share a link uh, which you, are, you can distribute to any social platforms that you have so that to, to ensure that many people uh, are making a follow-up of this dialogue. Then after such kind of announcements, I, may I take this opportunity to welcome the national coordinator from the Tanzania Human Rights Defenders Coalition, Advocate Ones Molengrumwa, to expand up the objectives and give uh, welcome remarks for this session. Please, Advocate Ones please may welcome. Thank you. Honorable Justice Robert Makaramba, uh, Dr. Natujwa Mvungi, fellow advocates who are here, students from law, uh, law School of Tanzania, journalists, uh, and other participants. We also have our, our partner from American Bar Association, Miss Viola. Can you, back there, we have Viola. Uh, co-organizers of this event. Uh, the Bar Association has a special project on uh, rule of law, a role project at the East African region, and I work together with American Bar Associations and other partners. Uh, good evening, if not good afternoon. Uh, it is evening, eh? Yes, yes. Now, why are we here? Of course, as lawyers, the legal profession is always dynamic and, and, uh, and flexible, uh, going with times, and we are supposed to also be current with any sort of uh, developments in the field of legal profession. Now, sitting here today, for this public dialogue, we also have our prominent 
emeritus professor, professor, Professor Isha Shivji, whom is globally known for his uh, personal stand and positions when it comes to human rights, globally and nationally here in Tanzania. So we also have him as a special public lecture, lecturer today, just to ensure that uh, you are all informed on what so far is going on in relation to the, uh, to the, to the, to the field of human rights, in particular public interest litigation. So we are going to have this discussion and dialogue today. At least the, I know some of you are aware of what is public interest litigation. And many of you, of course, might not be aware of what is public interest litigation. But briefly, public interest litigation is all about those litigations that have impact to the public and not to individual or personal interest. So anyone can go to court, but the outcomes, the consequences of that particular litigation impacts the entire community. That is what we call a public interest litigation. Now, that's what we are going to discuss today. And we have uh, very good uh, people, professor, retired judges, and those people who have been in practice litigating and also filing cases before a court of law under the name of public interest litigation. You will also have time to discuss, ask questions, contribute uh, in relation to this topic today. So our topic today is focusing only on public interest litigation, looking at where we came from, where we are, and where we are going. Last year, we had a number of changes, amendments, in relation to law enforcing uh, basic rights and duties here in Tanzania, especially the Basic Rights and Duties Enforcement Act, BRADEA, that significantly affected the positions, the stand of, of, of people, the citizens of this country, to defend the Constitution and to protect human rights through litigation. So that's all we are going to learn more uh, during uh, this uh, discussion. So my work was just to give you, I will have some discussion later around this particular area, but my task for now was just to make a welcome remark and introduce you, this, uh, uh, this dialogue to you so that everyone can be, we can all be in, one, in a common understanding so that later on when you are doing discussions and contributions, you will not go outside the topic. Our topic is focusing on public interrogation. And if you want to understand easily public interrogation, take all those cases like in particular case on independence, uh, ile case ya mgombe ya uhuru, take cases ile kama za kina Rebecca Giumi, ambazo zinazungumzia zimedai msichana asiolewa kiwa under 18. You can take those cases like the, the one of Wangwe, on kusu uh, madet, wakurugenzi wetu, kusumamia uchaguzi, na zikine nyingi ambazo you all know that they have been in court. That can easily let you understand what are we talking about today. Kwa wale ambao ni quite new kwenye, kwenye concept ya public litigation, na dhani ukikumbuka hizo kesi, ni raisi kuelewa watu na zungumza nini. Kwa hiyo, hiyo ndiyo eh, lengo kubwa sana la sisi kuwevo hapa, eh, na, na, na ndorol ya universities, schools, eh, zozote zile ni kuprovide a eh, room kuwa think tank. Yeah, hii ni think tank. Eh, position ya, ya wataalamu, wanafunzi, kukaa na kujadiliana some aspects katika legal professions. Eh, that's the only way you can do. Atuwezi kwenda barabarani sisi, but the only way you can contribute to this nation ni kufanya dialogues. And dialogues zinakuwa na outcome, kusabu zinakuwa na recommendations, is also impact knowledge, watu wanajifunza, na baadaye tunakuwa na community ambayo ni, ni more informed zaidi. That is our aim. So we aim to have a more informed eh, legal profession, uh, or expert katika legal profession, katika all aspects of the legal profession. The legal profession is very wide, but today we are focusing katika eneo la human right, in particular uh, public interest education. So in short, that's what we are going to do today. So thank you very much. Uh, I should end here. And now, it's time now we should... Uh, uh, Viola, you can also come and say a few words and greet uh, this uh, audience.
I will allow take my mic off and allow sorry my balakoa balakoba yes <laughs> uh barrier subui yes my name is viola and i work with is, am i correct someone at the front is laughing at me i don't know if i'm saying it. they are joining so imagine so that's why someone was laughing and no one was correcting me so my name is viola uh, i work with the american bar association um we work on a project in east africa on rule of law but i'm based in kampala so that's why i don't know swahili very well as you can imagine how i've landed already so my Swahili, I'm just learning kidogo kidogo. I bought a book three days ago, so very soon I'll be better than you. So I'm very excited for us to have this event at the law school. I know when you're in law school, um, your, your, your studies are very intense during the week. So on a Saturday, I'm very amazed that you people have dedicated your time. After being in class for uh, the, the rigorous nature of law school that you are available on Saturday to do this. Because I was telling Paul, the students might decide to wash their clothes, to visit their family members. You know, the whole week you've been rushing at eight to six, you have no time. And it's, it, it's amazing that you people are interested in such a topic that is, is crucial for the country of Tanzania. So briefly, the American Bar Association just supports our work related to rule of law. And part of our work is to work with law schools we work with law schools in East Africa. In Nairobi, we work with Strathmore. We work with Nairobi University. In, in Uganda, we work with four universities, uh, Gulu University, Makere University, Cavendish University, and then also part of the students of the law school in, 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 in Uganda. Oh, oh, oh. Here. You can't oh. hear. Oh, okay. You can't hear. So that is why I was asking Paul if people online are hearing. So I think let's pause until we fix that people online can hear us. That's why I was asking, that we need to make sure people online are hearing. Because you have Paul, you have to go outside and call for him. It will be people here. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll have to ask them. Okay. Hello? Can people online hear us? Why is there a uh, feedback? Eh? feedback. So whoever is helping us now. Um, people online just give us a minute. It was muted. Now you fixed it. Okay. So just make sure that someone is monitoring what's happening. The comments are posted online. That's not that easy. Mm -hmm. Not that easy. You are very busy. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome to our audience online, officially. I hope it is it's okay now. People online, please give us a thumbs up that you can hear us. Yes. Give us a thumbs up that you can hear us. Yes. We have people joining us even from the US, from Uganda, from, uh, so it's important that we also speak to them. Um, okay, where was I? Yes, um, I need to come back. Yes, so the American Bar Association supports initiatives on, in rule of law all over Africa and also East Africa. We are working in uh, Congo, in uh, Niger, in, Bo in uh, Burkina Faso, but also in Southern Africa. Zambia and uh, uh, South Africa and also East Africa which is Uganda and Tanzania which is part of the reason why we're here. So normally on a quarterly basis we uh, a, a law school or a university hosts us for a topic that is crucial to that country, something that is relevant for that country or something that is emerging in that country. So that's why we're here at the law school of Tanzania with you people who are uh, almost uh, advocates, though I hear you've only come in, this lot has just come in this cohort is just in for the second month. 
Um, we, we are excited that some of you, even when you finish law school, not all of you will become commercial lawyers. That some of you, um, there was a time I read a story in Uganda why someone became a lawyer. And all of you have your reasons why you, you become lawyers. So one of the students said, one of the lawyers said, he had just won a land case. He said when he was 13 and he watched his relatives steal his mother's land, that is the day he decided to become a lawyer. Now for some of you, you see a community that is vulnerable and that is why you choose to become a lawyer. Or even after, after Professor Shivri has explained to us and the eminent persons on this panel have highlighted us the importance of, of public interest litigation, that we hope that it's something that you will be interested in, that you will pursue, but also you will be an advocate of why it is important in Tanzania, of, of the importance, the, the justification for public interest outweighs the justification for no, for no public interest, especially when you have someone who advocates on another person's behalf. Because most public interest cases affect vulnerable people, people maybe who are illiterate, maybe people who have never gone to school, or people who don't know their laws and their rights. And the good thing about public interest, and the panel will also let us know, the difference between public interest and strategic litigation, how that helps a community or change certain laws in, in, our, in our countries, in, in, across the, the world. So without preempting what the panelists are going to say, I'll invite Doctor, who is supposed to be the, the moderator for this session, to take over, and then uh, we'll be able to start. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very impressed that we are all here. I don't really have much to say, rather than starting the program. Um, basically, what you have to understand is that um, this is to create a dialogue uh, to make you being inquisitive in what is happening in the country and how best as future advocates you can be part and parcel of change in our community. We are honored today, as the previous speaker has already said, uh, to have uh, Professor Emeritus Isach Shivji as our speaker. And I think it's high time. Professor, is he already online? He's online. He's online. Okay. Uh, professor, you're, you're there. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time. Uh, he is a lecturer of so many people in this country. He has nurtured so many advocates that you see today. And I'm sure that even Honorable um, Makaramba, you were also lectured by Professor Shivji. Myself, I was lectured by Professor Shivji. So we're really having somebody who is a guru in this field, and we are honored today that he found time to be with us and to lecture us and to, to involve you as the future of tomorrow in this important dialogue. Professor Karibusana. Can see you. You can see me, but can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Yes, it's more important to hear me than you speak. We hear you, we hear you. Okay, so can I start? Yes, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. And I want to thank the organizer for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity give my views on public interest. Straight away, 
all know and I'm sure you can take it for granted, subject to the discussion that we have later, that the public interest litigation, the source of standing for public interest litigation, litigators like the in in progress. 26 of the Constitution of the United Republic of Tanzania and the Constitution. In my view, the Article 26 has received somewhat superficial and mundane treatment in other way technical treatment. Of course, it has worked so far and continues serving the purpose. But I want to suggest to you that Article 21 is a very profound article of the Constitution with this meaning. So I will start with a kind of suspension of Article 26. Please bear with me those who are not interested in this food. But I think it is important for us to apply to his students to the understanding of our Constitution. So my presentation today is divided into four parts. Our first discuss the jurisprudential treatment of Article 26. Then I will discuss the amendment of basic rights and duties and enforcement act. Amendment which was made by the term known residential amendment of 2020 act number three. Henceforth, I use the word Bradea, and Bradea amendment. Then in my third part, I will discuss the question immunity. And in the fourth part, I end by discussing public interest litigation, or PIL, and its constituents. Specifically the question, who is the public? in the public interest litigation. So these are the four parts, and I hope I can complete my presentation in the time allocated to me. But if I exceed five or ten minutes, please. Now, let me ask once again. Am I being heard? Do I have Article 26 appears in part 3 of chapter 1 of the Constitution. And part 3, as we know, stipulates fundamental rights and duties. Article 26 has two sub-articles. Sub Article 1 says every person has to obey the Constitution or the laws of the land. Every person duty to obey the Constitution and the laws of the land. So clearly, some Article 1 is talking about duty. In sub-article 2, in the same breath, in the same article says, every person has the right to take legal action to ensure the protection of the Constitution and laws of the land. Now, I would like 
to underscore that Article 26 in the same breath talks about duty and right. My next question is, what is the, the right in some article? It is the right to take legal action. It is the right to take legal action. Why? To ensure protection of the system. So the right specified in sub-article 2 of article 26 is not a right to protect the Constitution. It is a right to take action to ensure the protection of the Constitution. Even in ordinary language, we don't say I have a right to protect you say, I have a duty to protect. For example, you don't say, I have a right to protect a dumb child. No. You say, I have a duty to protect or rescue a drowning child. So I want to suggest to you that the national duty it's embedded in Article 26 to the notion of duty is embedded in Article 26 to one, I will right to take the election, ensure the protection of the constitution, and two, I have a duty to protect the constitution. Both right and duty are provided, are embedded in some part of the two parts of the world. This is important because it is not sufficient to talk about right, but to the right to legal action, but there is also duty for every person to, to ensure protection of the Constitution. I will go further and suggest that Article 26 should be read together with Article 29, sub Article 1. In my view, Article 29, sub Article 1 is another very profound article in the Constitution matter of Republic, which I believe has not been deployed sufficiently by our What does it say? Article 29, sub Article 1 is double barrel. It has two meanings. First, every person, every person, the United Republic of Tanzania has the right to enjoy the fruit of his or her fundamental rights. Article 29 of Article 1 it has two means. First means say, every person in the United Republic of Tanzania has a right to enjoy the fruit of his or her fundamental rights. It is right to rights. It is not sufficient that you have been given a right. If we talk about simply having a right or possessing a right, then it's a one off situation. It is abstract. Article 29.1 makes it very clear that in fact it's a continuous right to enjoy your fundamental rights. So it is continuous. And I think that's more important in practice. 
There is not sufficient to have your life, but it's also important to enjoy those lives. Intellect. So, as I said, Article 291 gives you a right to enjoy the fundamental right. And it continues to Anything that breaches my enjoyment of my life. And I have a cause of action which is so when you have the opportunity gives you a base for a petition in which you can find a cause of action because your right to enjoy your life has been either agreeable or obstructed or diminished or in any way constrained. Now, I wonder how many three times have our lawyers and doctors used Article 391 to form the cause of action? I haven't seen any case which is squarely based on the work. And this is is so pointed out in our discussion. Nor have I noticed any jurisprudential rights by our academic lawyers, not the 39 Now, the second link of the 91 says in effect, that every person in the United Republic of Tanzania has a right to enjoy the benefits or the outcome or results. The word used in the soil is but okay. Of every person fulfilling his or her duty to society. Now that is very interesting. So, when a person fulfills his or her duty, every person in the United States of the Tanzania has the right to enjoy the outcome, the benefits of the fulfillment of their duty. Now, when you say that every person has the right to enjoy the fruit of the benefits of someone performing his or her duty, what are you saying? What do you mean by every person? Every person obviously is the public, is public. So every member of the public has the right to enjoy the benefits, the outcome, or the results of any person observing, performing, fulfilling his or her duty. Every person may enjoy the outcome of the fulfillment of duty by any person, means every member of the public. Hence, we are talking about public interest education. It is the interest of the public to litigate, for someone to litigate, to ensure that he or she carries down his or her duty to ensure protection of the constitution. The outcome of the litigation is the interest of the public. Once you read Article 26, 2, to very Article 29, 1, we get 
then it is found constitution maybe for public investigation. In other words, it did not have to, did not have to import PIR from other jurisdictions like India. We already had it in our constitution since 1984 when the Bill of Rights and duties was in certain institutions. The left judgment of the era, in the really high court case of Mutikela, which is reported in 1985, the Arizona Law Report, said it so much. <coughs> and also it talks about the duty to protect the Constitution. Did you not explain the right of the human interference? How did you arrive at the conclusion that every person has a duty to protect the constitution? And we just talk about duty to protect the constitution. And that for concluding, the article 26, sub article 2, gives the standing to any person can take legal action to ensure the protection of the Constitution. And since then, since 1995, when the Tequila was decided, for 25 years, you had a long line of authority, both from the High Court as well as the Court of Appeal, recognizing, acknowledging, Public investigation, public investigation in Tanzania. To the best of my knowledge, it has never been challenged. The last case that I read on it, which recognizes CIL in the case of Indonesia. So for 25 years, we have a solid, long line of authority which are recognized in PIA. Now let me come to the second part of my presentation. And this is the amendment of Gabea, Act number 3 of 2020. In 2020, Gabea was amended and straight away my conclusion of that amendment is that it sought to abolish PIL. The amendment, the intention, and the reading, close reading of the amendment is to try to abolish PIL. How does it do it? What does the amendment say? First, it renumbers section 4 of the day as subsection 1 and adds new four subjects. For our present discussion, it is subsections 2 and 3 which are relevant. That is the subsections 2 and 3 of the which were inserted by the amendment. Subsection 1 of section 4, as it stands up in the amendment, is almost a verbatim English translation of Article 33, 30 sub Article 3 of the Constitution. As you know, Article 30 sub Article 3 gives a person who is alleging a breach of his or her constitutional right in relation to him or her gives the right to file a petition to the High Court. The request for the law or the harm done to him or her. Sub-article 4, I'm sorry, uh, subsection 4 
for such one or such form of Brandeya more than repeats that. Now the new subsection 2, which is added by the man, stipulates that the petition under subsection 1 must be accompanied by a fidelity stating the extent to which the contamination has affected such person person. In other words, the accident must take the extent of the harm done to the British person. On the purpose of this, sub article, sorry, subsection 2, group in Already some more strange. How do you check in a day the extent of the harm? 20%, 30 percent, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 
So the amendment constructs 26.2 to 33, and the process closes the amendment. Closes two amendments into, into one. Three, the implication of the amendment is that 26.2 is subjected to or subordinated to Article 36. Whereas the plain reading of these two articles is clearly that these two articles are independent. Neither one is subordinate to the other, nor are they inter interdependent. They are independent articles. And that was the holding in particular case. The Article 26.2 and 33 are independent. They are not elected to each other. And they provide two sources of local sustainability. And this, since 1995, when was decided, has been upheld by both High Court and the Court of Appeal. Now, this amendment makes 26 to dependent on 33. In other words, it destroys the independence of the two sub of the two articles of the Constitution. So my conclusion is that the amendment results in two things. One, it stretches secret to the left of American Constitution. Which of course is Constitution. Because if the intention was to amend the Constitution and make 26 to subject to 33, then the proper procedure would have been to amend the Constitution under, I believe, Article 98 of the Constitution. But of course, that was not done. For reasons which are obvious, it will be politically very embarrassing. So the judge person thought that he was very clever by smuggling in the amendment of the Constitution by an ordinary piece of legislation. Second, second, the amendment in my view overrules the long line of high court the Court of Appeal Authority decision. Since it is the line of authority which has stood the test of time for 25 years, this amendment of ordinary legislation overrules this authority. Which, to say, to say the least, is never done by self respecting legislation. It is very rarely that the legislature passes a piece of legislation to overrule the decision of a court of appeal. It happened very frequently in a part in South Africa, where the South African parliament during that period would pass a legislation to overrule certain decisions of the court which they did not like. In Tanzania, as I know, there has been only one such piece of legislation. And this happened, I think, I believe, in 1962 or 1963, when this stuff in the Court of Appeal awarded an enormous amount of compensation to Chief Maria when the chief was abolished. The Tanganyika legislature at that point passed legislation to overrule that decision. But that has happened only once, as far as I know. 
Now, I, I understand that advocates, public speech advocates, public speech advocates have tried a number of petitions to challenge in the high court. Hello? Can you hear me? Sorry? We can hear you, we can hear you. Okay, I'm going on. But as far as I know, none has succeeded. There is one still change, and we hope that it will have better out. The only petition in uh, North Dakota which has succeeded was in a moot court, filed in the High Court of Zanzibar during the training of East African lawyers. Maybe the law students, maybe the students of the law school of Tanzania and the Africa, they want to get access to that judgment. It was written by a leading judge of the High Court of Tanzania and why it's a very good judgment. Where the judge declared the amendment as unconstitutional. Now, to wind up that part of my presentation, I'm aware that the Attorney General in such petition has put forward two for defense. One is that the amendment does not amend the Constitution. It only, it only provides a better procedure for the implementation of 26.2. In my view, this is a very big argument. First, the amendment is clearly not procedure. The substance is a demonstration. An amendment that takes away a free existing right cannot be called procedure. A substance. And secondly, why provide the procedure after 25 years? Because 26 2 was operational for 25 years. Why do you find a need to provide the procedure after 25 years? The second defense that I have constantly seen filed by AG is that the amendment is meant to win out three orders in the section PIF. But the protocol with that defense is valid. They have already provided in section 8, subsection, I believe it's 2 or 4, where the High Court reject the three orders in the section petition. So this is the amendment to super so It's already provided in the law. And the High Court, I mean, this case, even a single judge, has jurisdiction to the agenda to be given as a request. Now, let me come to the The is on subject immunity, and I'll show why I'm going to so. Subsection 4 of Section 4 of the day, the amendment, stipulates that the President, Vice President, <coughs> Prime Minister, Speaker, Deputy Speaker, or Chief Justice, They not be named in a petition. Any redress is sought against this office holder. The petition of the file against the Attorney General. And not the holders of this constitution of. A similar amendment has been inserted in the law reform.
which, as you might know, was a perfect order, an electricity application, which means that if you file a judicial review application where you are challenging the act or omission of the office holders, land office holders, you cannot file the application against them. Instead, you have to file. In my view, this provision, confusion between proper party and a necessary party. Alex, if for it, you against the wrong done by the president, your cause of action is that the president is either abused or exceeded his power in the constitution. The proper party to seek redress against is of course the president. And the Attorney General will be joined as a necessary part because in all public law litigation, the Attorney General is the one who represents government officer and institution. The Attorney General is a necessary part. But the property part, proper part, which has to be specified, is the one who is the wrong one. Undoubtedly, if you file such a petition, the Attorney General will represent the President. But the President has to be a part, just a proper part. Now, if you don't make the President a part, you get an absurd situation. To file a petition against AG, in the text of the petition, you elected the president as a use his power under the constitution. But the alleged transgressor is not before the court. The party before the court is the attorney general, who is not the transgressor. But the transgressor is not before the court. No respectable court will entertain such a petition. Without further ado, it is simply dismiss such a petition. Because you cannot make an order against a party which is not before the court, which has not been given here. Let me quickly give you a concrete illustration. Many years ago, if I remember correctly, a person who had petitioned to be enrolled as an adult was denied enrollment by the Chief Justice without being given a hearing. The aggrieved person filed a judicial review application against the Chief Justice and joined the Attorney General as a party. Now, if the situation was after this amendment, you would not be able to file a judicial review application against the president. You fight against the attorney general. But the attorney general is not denying the person to be a law. So how does it work? The conclusion that I make is that if you cannot make a name officer accountable for his public wrong, if you cannot take a law action against the named officer for the alleged public wrong, then you are in effect giving such a person immunity. And the man to suffer immunity. In fact, that person becomes above the law. Only in monarchies you have such a thing. Well, those of you who study your legal method well, you know. You are taught that the king does no wrong. And the king cannot be checked into his own court. 
such immunity exists, as I said, only in monarchy. That's what call it the Soviet Union. But not in democratic republic. There's no such thing as sovereign immunity under the report. All constitutional office there, constitutional office holders, that act in the president, are subject to law, are governed by law. They don't have immunity against breach of the constitution and the law. I come now to my final part which are for EIL and Sponsors. Briefly, who is the public in EIL? In the law, public interest situation fight in our course, by law. Sometimes in their own men. I have a feeling the public has not been chosen to protect And lastly, we are also the camp, some kind of a campaigning tool for political parties. Why the locals are doing a good job? But they do not have a large section of the public behind them. In other words, they lack public legitimacy. It's only the educated class the social media celebrities who are blocked. But that is not sufficient in my view. When a large section of the public, in our case, can teach you by down process, do not have any idea of what is going on in court. Now, if you do not have the support, I submit that you are fighting a lost cause. And I'll end by giving you a quick illustration on bank and bank conditions. A number of public justification in fight against the law of on unbailable of a example of money laundering here. Which is to be applied. But in the same court where you appear for a petition to be heard, you find hundreds of people who every day lose their freedom because they are unable to get bail, even in their level of it. For the simple reason that they cannot fulfill harsh conditions of bail that the courts impose as a years of society. I have the impression, and you may have found it wrong, that in our magistrate's court, Whatever the prosecutor asks for the conditions to be imposed are more or less accepted by the next. And the conditions are so, so harsh that ordinary people cannot fulfill them because they cannot afford the security of money or put in the, the titles for real property because they don't have real property and therefore invariably they lose their freedom and are remanded in custody. In other words, the person fails to enjoy his or her freedom simply because that person is impacting us or is not a real problem. Now, is the constitution? Is the constitution? I believe that such practice of imposing harsh conditions to be able to get paid is unconstitutional because it obstructs you from enjoying your freedom. And that is purely because you are not, don't have the capacity to afford to fulfill the conditions of bail. If you take the analogy of the Nanabo case, change is required a petitioner in an election petition deposit 5 million shillings was unconstitutional. 
because you are denied access to the court. I think that analogy can be used perfectly for such a case. And yet, I have not seen any public to just be taken to fight, trying to declare such conditions unconstitutional. Now, if you did file such a PIA, obviously it will attack the hard section of the public, who lose their freedom every day in courts because they cannot be very conditioned. Uh, Dr. Moderator, I finish with that and uh, look forward to the conversation. Some time is up. Thank you so much for the fruitful discussion and um, we welcome questions from you. Is there any mic in the public? Yes. Zanzibar regarding uh, 
public interest litigation and he wanted more clarification that that um, authority allowed yes the situation of public interest litigation in mainland that's how I got this question the authority you mentioned the case you mentioned in Zanzibar So sorry. <laughs> Can the person write question in the chat box, please? Or can you write it in the chat box? Yeah. Because we don't have the text box, so I cannot hear it. Okay, I think we will write it in the chat book and then you can you, you can you can refer back to it. Any other question? Constitutional Court of South Africa, and he was also a former freedom fighter. 
and actually he lost one of his arms in a car bomb in Mozambique where he was uh, participating in the liberation of um, South Africa. And in a lecture he gave in the London School of Economics, he came up with uh, some prophets and uh, he said the 19th century was a century in which the executive took command of the state, the 19th century. The 20th century was the century in which parliament took command of the executive. Now what about the 21st century? He said the following about the 21st century. The 21st century will be the century in which the judiciary secures basic rules and processes and the values of functioning of both parliament and the executive. Now, most of you are seated here. Is this thing happening? Do you see the judiciary commanding the parliament and the executive? If we heard what the professor was saying, that now there is a tendency of parliament passing law to overrule court decisions. And this is what happened for the past five years. Just with the strike of a pen, you overrule the judiciary. So now, what is not happening in the 21st century is exactly what happened after the amendment of the Bradea. Now that is what I wanted to make you understand, that the prophecy was made by none other than just as such, but what, what is happening on the ground is completely different. Of course, the, the public interest litigation issue um, as you can see, and from the, what the professor has said, is about taking legal action. And, uh, you saw how to take legal action under our laws after the amendment. Now, the, 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 the action you are taking, you have to take it in a court of law for the enforcement of public interest or general interest. Now, there is a problem, and the professor tried to explain, but I will amplify your that. If you ask yourself, who is the public, as the professor was asking, and how do you identify the public? Because in most public interest litigation we have had, you find individual advocates or leaders of civil society organizations. Now, where do you see the public? It's different from class action. Now that is the first problem. When people fail to locate the public, then they start uh, making some negative statements about the public interest in the nation. Now I'll give you an example. The, in the Rebecca Gumi case, she was defending, she was protecting the rights of young children getting married before time. Now it, it was only one person. But actually she was talking about the public interest of all the children below 18 years in Tanzania. You see the public interest of the country. We don't hold a meeting to get the interest. It's just to have the legal action taken on a matter which is of general public interest. And this is what distinguishes public interest litigation from other types of private litigation. That we have the public at the core of the, of the litigation. The second limb is the public interest itself. You remember there was a former judge of the England who said the, the public is an unruled horse. It can take you. So by public interest litigation, when you bring a case on environmental pollution, we are talking about the larger interest in hope of course in which you are also involved. Now that is what I should insist that uh, the, the multi-sector approach is critical that cases of public interest litigation be taken as if it's an individual effort. And I have always been telling lawyers that they should bring these cases as part of a team. Now, a good strategy in bringing a public interest litigation is to have a team of lawyers. We have lawyers, we have social scientists, we have everybody who is an expert in the area in which you are, you are, you are, you are, you are engaged in. Now, that is what uh, I had to say 
Now, my last point is that uh, as lawyers, as you know, public interest litigation does not only involve filing cases in our national courts, it involves filing cases in the regional mechanisms, one of which is this African Court of Justice and the African Court of Human Rights, People and Human Rights. Of course, another mechanism is the African Commission of Human and People's Rights. But most lawyers do forget that within our national system, there is a tribunal on human rights located within the Commission for Human Rights and Good Governance. And I had the opportunity also of serving as a commissioner in that commission for almost five and a half years. And we had a litigation conducted by that tribunal, the most important of which was the Nyamuma case, where some people in the Roria area and Rory has become also very famous because we have another small messiah there. And they say, man, as a kawabea wakil. And I feel it is appropriate there, but can't put a Rory for obvious reasons. Can't have Now, in that case, a number of villagers' houses were set on fire by order of the area commission. You see, so they had to file a case in the commission for human rights. So the commission, appointed a tribunal headed by the former uh, chairperson, Honorable the late Justice Sanga, and they heard the case and determined that those people had to be compensated. So they were awarded almost 890 million Tanzanian shillings in this compensation. There was some problem with the enforcement, but actually now I'm told the government has started paying out the, the compensation. That is my last thing, that for a lawyer, when you go to court on public investigation, another condition which you have to fulfill is how to enforce the decision, kind of. Because that is the most disappointing part. That you may come up with a very good court case, but this enforcement can be also a nightmare. Now, the, and as you know, the basic problem lies in our constitution as well. And that was then it's about to fight where they say, in case we succeed in impugning a law or an act, the court cannot declare immediately that it is unconstitutional. They have to give time to the person who injured your rights to correct. Now, I've always been saying that uh, lawyers must be strategic. It's not only if you see that litigation cannot work, you must resort to what we call alternative dispute resolution. There are some areas where you can engage with the violators on mediation and then you can sort out the matter of the necessity of going, going to court. But if you find that you have to go to court, then you can resort to it as a final or last resort. In our constitution, the constitution says that the courts are the ones that are with the authority to say what is final in the rest of the rights. Which means there are other institutions which can deal with rights, but the cost should be of last resort. So most public interest lawyers do not need to rush to court as a first instance. We have to try other avenues. Now in our constitution also on Article 107, sub Article AE, it talks about alternative dispute resolution. It's a matter of the constitution. But unfortunately, not so many people have taken up that challenge of using that alternative dispute resolution as a way of enforcing their human rights. And actually, in public interest litigation, if you use alternative dispute resolution, it may work very well because it involves the participation of the, of the people. So in an action, that's what I wanted to emphasize uh, because the, the, the good old professor has done a very good discussion on the, on, the, on the laws. Now, of course, finally, uh, as you will be going to practice, you will be interested to know what is the future of public interest litigation. The future of public interest litigation lies in the hands of so many people, including parliament. Hopefully, if they are convinced or lobby, they can change that law. Secondly, it also lies in our courts. The courts will be robust and to interpret the law to defend the Constitution. 
And now we have seen what the High Court decides, the problem of appeal may uh, decide the other ones. But what all the High Court and the Court of Appeal says, it can actually be uh, amended by, by way of legislation. Now, in other countries like uh, Ghana, in order to avoid this problem of hide and seek, people not enforcing decisions of courts, they put it in their constitution, which is the, I think is the only constitution, that there is a criminal offense if you do not fulfill your duty under the constitution. So they have criminalized the action of executive not abiding by court decisions when it comes to human rights. Now, I said, and we don't want to go there. But actually, that's why I've been saying that we should engage in a, in a, in a, in a dialogue uh, because those are human beings, they can be convinced and lawyers will assist by making them understand the import and the reach of our protection of our Thank you for that. the law turns 
to be to cater them? Are they ready to comply with? For example, maybe if I remind me, for example, the case of Rebecca Yumi, they say that they want to protect the, the, the child, the, the, the child below the age of 15. But are the parents, the, the child, are they willing to comply with the law? Because sometimes you might be fighting for the a certain right to a person, but however, the people, the group of people, doesn't see the, the specific protection as protection. They see it in another way, like a violation of protection, a violation of protection. For example, maybe a sukuma somewhere in Bariyali. For them to be married, a daughter to be married, regardless of the age, is a precedent. And by the way, they are, they are, even the diaries, so they are paid mentally. So when you're talking about the amendment, are, are, you, are we really looking about the interests of the people? Because in the end, no matter what the amendment is going to make, but however, if the people aren't ready to comply, in the end, it's going to be in, in, in country, I can say. Because some people, you, you tend to protect their rights, but they don't see it as a protection. They see it as a violation of their rights. So that's my view.
But I wanted to also to tell you about uh, uh, somebody called uh, Justice Bagwat. Justice Bagwat is a very renowned uh, Indian judge. Of course, he died. He and Krishna, they are the ones who actually were pioneers in public investigation in India. They say the three conditions for public investigation. First, there must be an injury. That's not part of me. As a public, I call it not individual. Because the individual can go on a tort case, but as a public, for a large public. For example, you remember the demolition exercise along uh, Morogoro Road? affected everybody, I call it. So it was the right issue, how do you frame it? Now the second one, that person who is called a victim, who has been injured, has no means of accessing the courts. Now we're not talking about people who can access courts. We're talking about poor people. You have father and mother and the who are now contributing to you some other people. I call it. Most of you are here and you are composed of family you see that time. By your education, you are going to, solve, to, to liberate not only your family, but the larger society. So how do you now use your knowledge yeah, the one that you need to speak? The third one, yeah, but, but what you say, Latma was always the point of what redress. Because it doesn't make sense if you go to a court of law and you get that redress. But a redress must be effective and you can implement it. So that is the third problem I told you about uh, courts. We have access to courts, we can declare them constitutional, but later, what is the redress? And actually, one of the biggest problems we are having is to be able to enforce decisions which arise from public interest litigation. Now, the last thing, um, a, a judge in Kenya warned that if lawyers are not careful, people might use public interest litigation to carry forward their political interests. And lawyers must be very careful. In Ikaribu na Uchakuzi, mtu anayibuka huwa na nafutawa kwa wana maakamani hili ya baje, live life. I worry. So lawyers have to be very careful. Is this a personal interest or a public interest? So someone can use the public interest to carry forward his public uh, political, political interest. Now, let's answer on a better way. He's at the forefront, although he's not affected. Now you ask him. Have you been in jail? No. Eh? Uh, can you access the court? Yes, but I cannot do on my own. Now, what are you seeking from the court? Now, there I will not get the answer because there has not been in jail. So, if you ask those questions, you don't get the answer. That's not the public interest litigation. It's not, that's not involved because you can use private litigation to achieve your personal interest. But if you use public interest, you must achieve the larger. But that's why I say lawyers who engage in public interest litigation should not have money as their interest. They should have the public as their interest. That's how lawyers also I advise them not to use public interest litigation. Why did you have cut the There are lawyers who go around boasting and say, you know, I'm the one who conducted the case in the Gui. So you ask him, why you Gui? No. But they are the lawyer. So you finish your job, why are you trumpeting? You can find a card that are too easy to keep on board. Can you imagine yes or yes, one of the city of Mama Richard? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I understand the question, what's the way forward for, for PIL in Tanzania, right? Yes. Okay, my short answer would be that if we are to reinstall public interest litigation after amendment, we, we need to mobilize the public. This is extremely important. We need to mobilize the public. And the only way we can mobilize the public is by building our own credibility. 
the world just operand of the same in the second intervention is extremely important. How do you think those lawyers in my life we must take two fundamental qualities to be able to calibrate in the public? These are one commitment and two competence. Commitment to the cause of freedom and struggle against children. Let us not forget that our public, large sections of it, in the urban area and villages, are leveling against great amounts of children. Their freedoms and rights are temporary left, right, and center. We must witness how in public meetings, some regional commissioners, and district commissioners simply ordered the police to arrest the cops. So I ask you a particular question for the seventh year. So, first and foremost, quality of the public in this way is to commit. Must be committed to fight for the cause of freedom. So, for the public, the large section of the public, and the public here means the set those who are oppressed. True competence. It's extremely important that public interest lawyers must be competent in, the, in terms of the profession. Because public interest lawyer litigation is not a ground for training. And many young lawyers, I'm not to say all, but the many young lawyers undertake the idea of the public of gaining experience. Once the public government yeah, yeah, do business. That is not a committed PIA, public interest law. It's not a ground for training, nor is it a ground for gaining salary status. It's another important point to keep in mind. Because if you do so, then you lose credibility in the field. You lose credibility in the field. So I think these are two fundamental qualities of a public interest law, competency and commitment. And therefore, I repeat what I said. <coughs> the public has mobilized side by side court cases. We have to find ways of publicizing and bringing to the public domain what Judge Bakarama was saying, social problems, which you convert into legal issues. Then only you can get education. And it will be the public who will defend the process of the act. Without them, you cannot really move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Credibility and competence. Credibility and competence. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Uh, we welcome right now um, Onesmo to give us a, a quick insight on the impact and procedures for public interest litigation. That requires 
the enjoyment and enforcement of human rights to be in line with various regional and international standards. Now, with the Constitution, as what our professor said, uh, the amendments that were done last year quickly uh, violated the, the Constitution. The provision of the Constitution or amended the Constitution through the backdoor procedure. Just by taking the two provisions, 26, 2 and 33, and making them to be one or depending on each other. Therefore, generally, the, 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 the opportunities for the rights and duties of this citizen, of our people in Tanzania, to, 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 to defend the Constitution or to be part of the process of defending the Constitution or protecting the Constitution has been already eroded uh, extensively. So now, that room, the wider room that existed of people of this country, civil society, and whoever, to use the constitution provisions to defend whatever sort of rights within the constitution or other laws of this nation has been significantly eroded. So that can be one of the impacts to the constitution, among others that have been already explained. Now, coming to, to impact in human rights, civil society, and the PIL itself. If this amendment are implemented, the gains in human rights litigation may be uh, narrowed down to individual, and therefore minimizing or reducing the number of public interest litigations in our country. As what Bakwati Jadisidian Bakwati said, oftentimes public interest litigations are litigated by those spirited individuals, and this one was repeated in the case of Mutikila. Spirited individual with capacity and knowledge. Now, the recent amendment narrowed down or erodes the role of its spirited individual, those who are knowledgeable, capacity, who have capacity not only in financial but also uh, in terms of uh, knowledge and procedures and human rights, have been their, 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 their space has been eroded. Now, with that situation, therefore, those who need to be presented might stay without having those individuals spirited, uh, spirited individuals like. Because you had Tikila, uh, Rebecca Gilmi, and others who have been filing cases on behalf of the public. Now, with this recent amendment, it's that you are supposed to show how personally you have been affected. Actually, it's like now the 262 is no longer in use. We are now focusing on 33. In Kenya, for instance, last year, about 300 cases of, on public investigation were filed in court. But in Tanzania, we are struggling, but we don't even reach 30 cases per year. Now, with this amendment, that number might even go down. Because now, with this amendment, now the impact to NGO is that NGO can no longer. Of course, it is very hard to fight a public investigation under Pradea today as an NGO. Because first of all, you are supposed to show how that particular NGO has personally affected by that particular injury or violation. So you can see that now, by 2062, previously, both NGOs as a legal person and individual as, as natural person had an opportunity to litigate public investigation. But with this amendment, Actually, the door is, is like a, has been narrowed. You have to struggle a lot. You have to struggle for you to be able to get, for, for your case to be admitted in court and prove how being, as an individual or as an NGO, you've been personally affected. So the issue of local standard was not an issue previously 
as what well, it was explained by Justice Makaramba and Prof. Sashi, it was not an issue for 25 years. So many cases went in court, and the issue of uh, whether you have been personally affected, if you, if you have taken a case under 262, was not an issue. But now, uh, it is like a, a requirement of the Pradea that you have to show that. So the impact is that we have no, we have no people or NGOs, you know, or even lawyers who can actually bother themselves to go in court and struggle to prove before the court how personally been affected, why in, in real sense public identification does not require. So, so it's just to prove, you are supposed to prove according, according, according to what just for what you say in one of the cases is that you are supposed to prove how you are representing the public in court of law and not how you have been personally affected. The bona fide. You are supposed to be, uh, you know, with the Fika Pane, but for Rebecca Kim, Rebecca Kim, that's it. Let me use this as an example. The case of Rebecca Kim, she was not married under 18. She did it. But she opened, she, she had a large case, not because she was actually forced to be married under 18, just because she proved before the court that she has a public, there is a public interest. <coughs> the case has public interest for all guests in this country who cannot defend, who cannot access the court, who cannot go before the court. So that, that there should be someone, a, a, a splintered individual, to go before the court and 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 stand. What happened to this mic? I, I, I remember this mic. The lost two mics sometimes. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was also a student some years ago, but not far, just two years ago. So I know how they sometimes react. Thank you. So there is the, now if that's the case therefore, if lawyers or individuals, printed or NGOs cannot go to court and litigate for public interest litigation and litigate for human rights, that means our role of promoting and protecting human rights also goes down. Because there are so many ways of promoting and protecting human rights. You can protect through advocates, meetings, demonstrations, and also you can protect and promote human rights through courts of law. Now this wing of promoting and protecting human rights through court of law is like now is totally closed that you cannot go, you know the best way, the most wise and most civilized way of defending rights is just to go, is by way of litigation, going through, through course of law. But I like instead of going down to roads and whatever, it's a like bit civilized if you take a case and defend the rights of certain people, like the issues are Wakurgesi, you know. Now, now case even in Japan, the Nigerian society, what for the owner, the best option is just went to court of law, which is more simple like the way of defending rights. But now that door is like now, it's like it has gone. As what Professor Jashiki is saying, it's purely an abolition of public investigation in Tanzania. Now, uh, the proposed amendment, unfortunately, depart from the pre-established remarks in our jurisprudence that the principle of public education are expressed in constitution by investing capacity on a person and individual and as a number of community with a standing standing to use. This important guidance offered by High Court in the previous cases. For your impact in the Kwamba Tayari, Kama Alibosema Professor Shindi, to Mesha or no principles are those the of the Mrefu and Makamazetu who also public investigation in Tanzania. It's no longer there. Unless you part a decision of the court that might declare this uh, amendment of the constitution uh, of the Pradea to be unconstitutional and therefore uh, bringing back the position that was there in relation to PIN in, in Tanzania. For example, take a provision in Kenya. Kenya, uh, the, the relevant provision in 22 of Kenya of constitution states that 
every person has a right to institute court proceeding claiming that a right or a fundamental freedom in the Bill of Rights has been denied, violated or infringed. In regard to rule of, in regard to rule, the Constitution under Article 3 give a Chief Justice power to make rules providing for court proceedings and whatever. Now, according to our procedure, for now, if you want to go to court under Bradea, under Bradea, the amended pro the provision, section 4, article 4, you are supposed to go with uh, an affidavit showing how you have been personally affected. That's one of the significant impacts yeah, in the procedure. Some impact in, in whatever way. But the procedure nowadays is it's not like it was before. Just you take your, 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 your originating summons, you, you take it directly to the court and proceed with the court. Today, you are supposed first of all to proceed with, uh, with uh, an affidavit showing how you have been personally affected. Uh, now, this is the requirement. If you read that, Bradea amendment, uh, all uh, provisions in the number 8, section 4, in attacking the requirement to April, and we've been doing this. Some of the cases that, that have been filed pro post Bradea uh, have been going under this procedure. Now, now what can we do there so far? Nikwamba, there are courts, there are cases in court of law. There is a case in court of law here in Tanzania, High Court. There is also a case before regional court on the same matter. Try to request the court to see how these provisions, the amendment of, of Pradea, have, 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 have offended the Constitution and therefore declaring them to be unconstitutional. So this is what we've done and uh, we are waiting now to see what will be the result of those uh, uh, court cases. But we're also doing a lot of engagement, trying to convince, doing advocacy as what we are doing right now, just to convince our authorities to see the need of uh, amending the amended Bradea uh, provision, especially almost those four provisions, and retain the same status that we had, and that was already uh, positioned by decisions of the court for many years ago. We are also uh, trying to, of course, in one way or another, it is, it is, it is very hard, uh, but there is no other mechanism of what we can do, uh, apart from uh, also telling our members of parliament that uh, uh, some of the laws that are going through the parliament need their, their scrutiny because they are there as a representative of the people. We see some of the laws are going before the parliament, they don't get proper scrutiny of the member of the parliament, but those laws again come back and affect the people they represent. Therefore, in brief, the amendments that were done, were done last year has significantly affected uh, the position of public interest litigation in Tanzania, almost keep that position. We are struggling to go through the court of law, uh, not as it was before. But, but again, this also erodes the spirit of NGOs, individuals, to defend human rights through courts of law. This might also affect the, our, our academic institutions because it has also gone to the level of uh, amending the procedures and principles that have been taught for a number of years. The case of Utikila has been used, it has been written globally, but over suddenly we have a law that has, that has a very difficult, far, a far, a very far position to that particular case that was decided in relation to public interest litigation. So that's all about, uh, about uh, 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 the impact of Pradea and the future of uh, public interest litigation in Tanzania. Now, quickly, because you are, you are students of law 
and some of, some of you here are advocates. Uh, currently, the procedure of uh, filing cases before uh, the court of law with a new amendment uh, is, 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 is not quite far from what we were doing, but it's a bit tricky that, uh, first of all, you should understand, according to Pradea rules and the Pradea Act, the procedure is you are supposed to use the originating summons. You may have originating summons. Eh? My problem. I think you will get uh, this article or uh, what I've written, the, the sample there. Now, previously, we just had that originating summons, and then uh, we feed it, you have an affidavit, and then you are done. But now the procedure requires that you, you need to have that originating summons and uh, another additional affidavit. That affidavit has to proceed to registrar of court for your case to be admitted. And you have to prove you have a personal injury to attain a sort of violation that you want the court to give you a witness. When you are your procedure, so you, you need to have that matter and you go with it. Uh, if what it will be a that you don't have uh, a local standard. Wow. When we are to prepare in our Africa department, Sassons, and we know how to put a living on the Tiso, and that's about the end of the year. If you're in a very tough one, one of me and my age, one of Sumi and Garia, and the Sala Toso, the society, one of the petition you are okay, like in the battle public in our army. Public
una, una, una persona di lì, una 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 au nafasi ya ibada ya 26 ya ibada ya mbele ya ibada ya 26 mbele mbele ibada ya 26 katika mbele mungano ambayo inatoa kinga kwa kwa mtumishi rais anakuwa na kinga kwa mambo yote ambayo anakuwa anafanya sasa kwa mtu ambaye unaona unaishi kutokea na na public interest ni kutu ya hiyo ibada ya 26 ya ibada ndogo kwa 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 sisi kama rais unaweza kukaa kuna 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 kitu au ni impact au kama kuna kitu kitu ambayo inaweza kuchukuliwa na na watu wa kwanza kwa sababu tunapunjwa na mwili ambao unakinga Sasa je kupitia hii ya ni procedure zipi? 
e, wananchi wanaweza wakatumia ili waweze kupata basi kupitia kwenye hiyo hela ambayo serikali imechukua. Sasa Asante sana. Kwa upande wangu najaribu uh, kuweka public interest integration katika sehemu mbili. Naweka katika narrow perspective na katika wide perspective. Mtumizi wa mwisho alotukisha kwenye procedural matters as far as dear concern anasema kwamba kuna baadhi ya case siko mahakamani kwa sababu na wamefanikiwa kushio course lakini baadhi nao azipo katika majina ya civil servants sasa najaribu kufikiria kwamba amendment ya mwaka jana imejaribu ku abolish PAL in wide perspective kwa maana kwamba kuna watu ambao walikuwa wanaitumia hii loophole kufanya mambo yao kama uh, wazungumzaji ambao tunaambia kwamba kuna baadhi labda wana siasa kwa natumia hiyo nafasi kuweza kutumia kupeleka yani kutumia kama kukunza interest zao katika masuala kama siasa sasa kwa nini civil societies haziko haziko uh, comfortable kupeleka PAL and another perspective yani ni mtafute mtu aliyeandika moja kwa moja awe awe mbele alafu wao wawe nyuma wanataka wao ndio wawe bila alafu ile mtu awe nyuma ni kwa nini hawa comfort au mtu pia huko asante sana between activism and the public interest litigation. 
they do the presentation, they give up the, it's like, he touched the, the, those words, uh, but he didn't uh, elaborate more. So I want to know the difference between the activism and the, activism and the public interest education. But also in case of, of on the last contribution made by the <coughs> Professor Shiki, responding to uh, uh, Onesimo on the room of the last uh, present, uh, presentation there, that uh, uh, Professor Shiki said, the registrar has no power to admit or not to admit uh, the petition. So I want to know, with regard to the final cases, uh, the group online, nowadays in fact, cases in uh, our court floor, group online, and the, the registrar has the power to admit or not to admit. And the, uh, if I far well, what the professor should be saying, before and after the amendment, the registrar has no power to admit or not to admit. That has been done uh, through the court process. So I want the comment from him. Thank you.
wasi nilipata kumuuliza mheshimiwa kama watangulizi wetu katika hii ya sheria na kwa mfano wenu hapa tukitoka kuna watu mbalimbali watakufuata kuwasaidia na tunayo haki ya kuwasaidia lakini inapokuja kwa public interest na ambiwa mpaka uwe umeathirika moja kwa moja lakini unapomwakilisha mteja lakini unakuwa hujaathirika moja kwa moja lakini katika public interest sasa kama watangulizi wenyewe wana mpango upi wa kuweza kutatua tatizo hili Yes, I can hear you. Can you speak slowly so that 
Uh, one of the questions was also on the impact of Article 26, sub Article 2, as regarding to Article 42. Was it Article 42? 40? Article 46. The impact of Article 26, sub Article 2, the amendment of it uh, to Article 46 of the Constitution, meaning that if the, 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 the executive, they get immunity, and if there are people, as you said, who are, who are mentioned, that they're not supposed to be named, that they have infringed the law, and now where do those people who are affected, where do they go? Kama mbimili wenyewe, jo unakuja shiria. Sasa watu wataenda wapi, kama mbimili wenyewe, unapata kinga, kupitia kubadilishwa kwa article 26 sub article 2 kupitia kwa pradea asa where do people go where can they seek remedy yeah um there is one theoretical possibility lakini nikitike nadharia kwa sababu kwa mfano kwa mujibu wa katiba yetu the president can be impeached in the legislature for being an unconstitutional act among others. But if you read the impeachment, the procedure for impeaching the president is what can be impossible to pass through those again. Because to be able to impeach the president will require ultimately two thirds majority of the parliament. And as it is, our parliament is dominated by the president's wife. So that, that process, the political process of impeaching, is not easily available. Hence, it is important for us to realize that to be able to vindicate your rights and to be able to vindicate the constitution, we will be held to struggle on two fronts. One in the legal front, two litigation, but two, but by mobilizing and raising the consciousness of the public of how these amendments affect them directly and how the amendments affect their freedom. Mind you, at the end of the day, judges are not angels. They also come under pressure. And one of the pressures they can create is to a conscious public, a public which is aware. And that pressure, in my view, is one way of pressurizing the judiciary to do what is required to make the Constitution. But if the public is silent, if the public is not aware, and in all their skin, they on their own, they can fight this battle until they are mistaken. And I think the experience of the last five years has clearly shown lawyers alone cannot fight on the legal front. We need to open up more than legal front. We need to have a public front to be able to vindicate the rights of the U.S. in the Constitution. And I think on that front, we have been rather big. We have been big because partly, and not so all, Partly because our civil service organizations do not have a public capacity. They are over dependent on the funding agencies. And therefore, the agenda is set by the funding agencies. It's therefore extremely important for the civil service organizations, for the civil society organizations, to cultivate the constituency in the public, particularly down and Thank you, Professor. I think the other questions will come, um, Judge Makaramba. You can help us to tackle them and then also on next floor um, thereafter.
judgment in the end of life. Now, the only salvation that we will know when there is such kind of a constitution, we have two salvations, the people and the courts. Courts have to be moved. My account has yet done it after case. It's not even. We don't go, we are not uh, what we call the ambulance chaser. We don't go asking, have uh, you been in check? <laughs> we don't. Because you, you, you will breach one of the principles of independence and impartiality. So judges are also part of society, definitely. You cannot say that all oh, those who are suffering are not part of this. But you cannot go and then and bring a case out will deal with it. There was a time, and I will tell you the reason behind why we, why we have the Bradea. Once upon a time in this country, we did not have a procedural law on how to bring human rights cases. After the, 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 the amendment of the Constitution in 1984, when we were at the middle of the right, there was no procedural law. But people were going to court and had to the about the three of the Constitution. And actually, that's why we have so many cases during that period upholding the, 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 the human rights. You remember Justice Marusan? He was a sole activist, you may say, as a judge. And actually, it created a problem because people were following Morusanya, not the law. They would go all the way to where Morusanya is sitting so that they can find this. They call it forum shopping. And we can see that behavior also sometimes happening. Lawyers say that I have my judge. Nobody has his own judge. The judge is under the law. So you take case to him, you listen to the evidence and render a decision. But we have that kind of situation because of what happened. Now, when the law, finally we had the procedural law, what it does, what it did, actually, it went against some of the provisions of the Constitution. And then people went to court at a particular time, but finally we had the independent candidate case, and I love that decision because the judges made two critical observations. One, there is no basic structure in our Constitution. Now, what that means is that you can change any provision of the Constitution. Any provision. Including saying, I do not know if they can say now, from today onward, we don't want the division. I don't know if they can do that. Or from today, from today onward, we are becoming a political party, a civil political state. I leave it to you to decide if that. The second aspect is that. Uh, they, they, they use the political doctrine question in a wrong way. The political doctrine question goes like this. If there is a matter which is purely political, it is not for the judiciary to be done. I know it. It is parliament because they are representative of the, of the people. One of which is the question of independent candidates. They say this is for the public to be done, not the, the courts. I do not know whether they were wrong or right because that decision is still binding on us. The other thing is that the, 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 the question which was asked <laughs> differentiate between activism and public interest in education. And actually, I say sometimes people use the word activism wrongly. The moment you mention activism, everybody runs for cover. As if it's some, some, someone from Mars. But what it means by activism? In the name of the judiciary, it means being proactive. There is a difference between being an activist and being proactive. But of course, it's a, short, a, a shortcut they use, judicial activism. But actually, it's being proactive. That is, judge at your guest. And I'm going to tell you, it's not only the spirit of the law and Black letter. For example, there is a provision in the Constitution which says any law. Now, what does any law mean? It includes also case law. I put it. It includes customary law. It includes Islamic law. So long as it does not violate basic principles of the, of the Constitution. So, but what is law? It means law which is made justly. An unjust law is not good law. I'll give you an example. In South Africa, during the upper phase, all the laws were made by parliament. The procedure was fine. But there was a law which says a white man cannot marry a black woman. 
It was the law in Panama. But was it the just law? It was not because it was discriminatory. I told And discriminatory discrimination is in our constitution. So in a nutshell, what I'm saying, that's what I said we need a knowledge of the judiciary, which is robust. I agree. So that they can take off the bull by the horse. There was, once upon a time, there was such kind of judges. Now, I'm not so sure what is happening now because they are not, no longer there. Now, that is another way of uh, answering. So the, that's the difference. But in public interest litigation, it is what we, we will get in what is called dialogical activism. Dialogical activism, it involves a dialogue between the person who brings a public interest case in a court of law, the judges who are deciding that case, and whoever is involved in that process, whether it is civil society or not. That is what we call dialogical. It is dialogue, dialogical activism. Finally, what comes out is a decision which brings about social change. So in a way, judges who are involved in deciding public interest cases, they are also involved in bringing social change. And that's why anyone who brings social change by legal action is called an activist. I call it. It works to me in a narrow way, thinking the activism might be on time. But the Guinea is a political interest. Eh? Personal interest, political interest. Can political interest also be public interest? Of course, the, the line is so narrow. What I'm saying, the test is very simple. It's the matter of great public interest. Now, it doesn't matter who is bringing up that political interest. They wouldn't. They that to the public interest. It could be a politician. The only thing is the outcome should not be the eagerness to run for power because politicians are only seeking power. Any politician, as a Kagarian, come on, he wants to go to state house, where I should have done a Finally, you want to go, you want power. As a Kagarian, very political party, as you have to look you see a political party, you know, but you see a political party. Any political party seeking for power. Okay, I know it. Simple test. Now, if you bring a public interest case with an aim of assisting you with getting power, access to power, that is wrong. You should bring it because you are affected as a public leader. There's no way we can prevent you from bringing that, that case. The outcome is more important. But you should know that public interest litigation is a process. In a court case, in the finality, it's a process. I call it. It involves so many things. And then there is this question. Um, Sasa, the other way of distinguishing this, you ask yourself, do you want to access justice or to access power? If you want, you can answer that question, then you will know that this is a public interest. If you want to access justice for a certain group, that is public interest. But if your aim is to use public interest to access power, that is wrong. And that's why we say the political interest. And then there is this um, issue and they ask me on environmental degradation. And I will, I will try to answer uh, quickly. Uh, and actually, sometimes lawyers will struggle with what is a legal right and what is a human right. A human right is also a legal right. But not every legal right is a human right. Human right and our constitution must be followed what is certain in the constitution. If you read at the third subject of three, it says any person can contest any action or any law. Now, at our constitution, any action has been subscribed because we don't allow judicial review of human rights actions. That is prohibited at our constitution. Secondly, we prohibit any intended bill from being contested in our constitution. Other jurisdictions they are now. In Kenya, you are allowed. Judicial review can be used as an avenue for contending human rights. So now what you see in our, in, our, in our system is continuously narrowing down avenues for challenging human rights violations. 
So that is that creates a, a really uh, serious issue, and we need everybody, not only the, the judges. India, can they, those who have been uh, affected, can they see? If you want to go to the Commission for Human Rights, you must have a complaint. A complaint is much broader than a dispute. A dispute is the final continuum when you had a conflict. Everybody, you had a conflict with mining companies. Then there was no solution. It became a dispute. Everybody. So you had a cause of action. You go to court of law because a court of law is the only mechanism for determining violation of rights because it is a legal right which has been abrogated. But the Commission for Human Rights can deal with every type of complaint. For example, that is, there is a mining company which is causing pollution. It has not yet become a, a, a matter for the courts. It is still a conflict stage. Now, I shall give you an example. When we had a case which actually I conducted when I was in the Commission for Human Rights, uh, by it was a uh, resolute in Zega. There were, there were some complaints that they violated the rights of the people whose land they had uh, taken for mining, and they brought a complaint to the commission. So we had to go there and conduct a public hearing to hear both sides and then make a decision on who had the right to be uh, heard and what conversation he can get. Now, in order for you to be able to use alternative dispute resolution, um, first, don't go to litigation. But if there is a violation of rights, as Professor Shifty has said, and we should have made that point very clear, it is only the courts which have powers under the Constitution, no any other mechanism. And as we said in Psalm 3, it does not suggest any other it is only the high court. But with the laws, there are many ways actually, even the reference can be heard from the from the lower courts. So yes, in order for you to deal with that complaint that will be not being uh, compensated, you can involve the Commission for Human Rights. It will bring both of you on the table and discuss the matter and sign an agreement. The only problem you should expect that uh, that agreement should be respected by the honored by the, by the parties. If they can't, and this is why the commission has extra powers, the commission can actually file a human rights case in the court of law. I follow you. If for anything, you can bring a human rights case on your behalf. But of course, you know the problems of whether it is part of the government, it is independent, and all those things. But they have those powers to also bring public interest cases before a court of law. In the Nyamuma case, after the government, of course, delayed paying the compensation, they took the matter to court because under the law, it says in order to enforce the commission's orders, you have to file them in the court for enforcement. Now, the judges of the high court, when, when they heard that case, they made a confusion. They thought they were to go to, to the merits of the case. For those of, among you who know the procedure on the enforcement of arbitral awards, it is very closer to that. That when you are, you are enforcing an arbitral award, you don't go to open the merits of the case. You are only to recognize and enforce it as a court decree. So that you can now invoke the content of power provision if anybody refuses to execute that. But in a country of gentlemen, human rights, and I respect the uh, human rights, what you pay why they can actually decide to pay instead of involving the cost so that they will be held in, in, in content. Now, the other one, of course, those issues, when you have to put a have to go to the and to the house, you have to go to the house, you have to go to the house, you have to go to the house, you Now, there was this question about. Uh, uh, let me phrase it this way. Uh, legitimacy of Bunge, legit parliamentary legitimacy, comes from the people. And this is a 
the article 8 of our constitution. Sovereignty, power of the people. The government for the people on behalf of the people. So even parliament for the people on behalf of the people. Now, if the executive and parliament messes up, there is this fair balance of the equation under the judiciary. That is, the judiciary now, as a last bastion of, of guardian of the constitution, has to stand between the people and the, 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 the executive and the, 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 the parliament. So, that, those are the powers. We have agreed and gave it to our judiciary that they should be the uh, the, they should balance the equation. Because power is, uh, is, is sweet. Absolute power or absolute. You should expect that. There are people who go beyond. So there's be someone who will put them in line. Actually, the basic foundation of the modern constitution was to limit the powers of those who are in power. Now, when you have power, this is going to affect you the human nature. Well, those are the kind of things. Now, if the judiciary wants to uh, to prevent that, they should be. Uh, now, finally, and I'm winding up this by saying, I said the constitution is the one which actually limits powers of all the other institutions. The constitution is actually which, which gave the, the, the judiciary powers of checks and balances. And these powers of checks and balances are very critical. You will be surprised that most people complain that it is the president who appoints the judges, and the judges are paid salaries by the state, and the judges are supposed to put the president on hold if he exercises the powers wrong. That is the pinnacle of liberal democracy. parties, of course, So in order for them to be independent, to abuse the Zulu Sama, to work in the immunity, the one who is going to be a if he has decided the case, with whichever way. Because in any case, there must be a winner and a loser. That is another principle of agree. If you don't want that, you go to alternative district. But if you go to court, there is a winner and a loser. And actually, the other thing is that the loser should humbly agree and pay the compensation which has been determined. Now, finally, judges are also, the courts are creatures of study. They are established under the Constitution, which means they have to respect and abide by the Constitution. So any judge, any court worth the name must act within the bounds of the judiciary. But any court worth the name must make sure they are all the rule of law like anybody else. Other judge in Muruga Sharia, no rules of the Mahakama, I told you. You cannot bring up to say, maybe I'm a judge in Nigeria, I'm a baby. Come on, the point of criminal argument, they'll bring you before another judge. You come on, you go approved it beyond the reason of doubt, you go. So, 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 public confidence and trust in the division. Because of that, they, they believe from when we take our cases to court, that part of just our fair outcome. I it. But people who are under the doubt, who should trust the Amada, are under confidence in What I take to the streets? Yeah. Some leaders will say, Google my mama, we are not going. So in a modern democracy, when you set people using 18th century tactics, the most weak, the weakest part of society. Why don't you not have to wake up private security or direct security? I worry. That in six one young way, none of that will Our salvation only lies in a constitution, the law, and the judiciary, which is impartial and independent. Thank you. Yes, uh, 
most of the questions have been uh, answered. There's a question of what is spirit. That actually, that question was also asked in the city, but actually may respond that you, you, you say why we are saying the distraught have no power to deal with the disabilities of uh, application. Of course, in, in real sense, uh, registrar are the administrative organs, but have a certain role to play in advising lawyers to follow the procedural matters of filing cases. And nowadays, we are using an online mechanism, and if you don't follow the rule of, rules of procedure of filing cases, of course, your matter might be dealt with the registrar. Because they are there just studying of procedures of filing cases. They don't go to the content. But at some point, I remember, in my, if my grandma might correct me, in election petitions, even registrar were very excited to free and, and even at supporting advocates to have proper uh, applications. In 2015 elections, it was one of the elections in which registrar played a very significant role after attending a training that was actually uh, the, the, the trainers were, uh, the, the Magarapa and uh, other, of course, and other judges were the trainers. They received that sort of knowledge and were, they managed to support advocates to make proper applications and filing of cases. So at some point, we, we, we don't say that uh, uh, the registrar do not play a certain role in admissions and filing of cases. They have that role, but they don't go to to to, to, to that deal. We were looking at the content now of what, what is, is is filed. But the procedure now and above right is that you take your admission, uh, your, your certificate, I mean your affidavit of admission. Of course, that's what the law say. But according to Professor Shields, that was was not the the, the role. Of the registrar, and even after Bradea, I mean, I think that is very clear. Now, the question that you asked about uh, compensation of those people who have been uh, affected by environmental pollution, why is only named the government that takes that money? That is our role now as lawyers to go and look at the Environmental Management Act, and if you see it, it makes sense. Why those heavy fines are only taken by the government? Why those people who have been affected by pollution are not even compensated at any point? But when you take a case independently, we have some cases that we find where while I was at the legal human center, uh, and whenever the compensations are provided by, by those companies, they go to the to the to the public, the victims. Because it's it, it is an effort of individual victims who went to court to fight against it such kind of violation. But when it comes, it is named in uh, whatever sort of investigation, they found that the pollution, of course, those fines are always going to the government. I agree with you, but now that is what is your role. As a lawyer, an upcoming lawyer, of course, you need to go and see how you can uh, address that matter. You now know the procedure, just take that law. If you find that it, it offends the provision of the Constitution, just go through there the procedure that you know. Otherwise, I think most of the questions have been asked. And the question of why civil society? Why are we struggling to use the previous mechanism, the wider perspective of going through course of law and not using the current procedure, which requires a, a, a certificate, I mean, a affidavit of an experience? The, the issue is, if you, are, if you have a law and then you have a window, if someone tells you to go through, through to, to, uh, to come through this hall, through a window, and instead of using the door, what, what, what kind of laws do you get there? There are some people who not be able to go through the window. It's very hard to go through the, the, the window than going through the, the door. So the, 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 the issue is the current amendment in Kamavide in Alazimisha, what why the Mahakamani went here by the moon side. And uh, that some people may not be able to do that. The one to not struggle to rule when you must be a young man. In a in a in a way, he may be far poor. He may he may find out to attach it into our ways. Ah, when that will be here, we will be our ways. You see, so it makes only few people in the video who can serve. I'm going to show case. I'm going to prove that it's impossible to run a case. 
ukienda kule inachukua vio kwamba kule ana personal na kesi nyingi sasa hivi vio zinakuja za namna hii kwamba you don't have personal injury by injury why should you file this case while you don't have personal injury sasa hiyo ni sawa sawa na kwamba tunataka sasa mtu awazi kufikiria hii kesi bana walio 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 kwa evicted ni watu kule na tarime so why should i bother here in dar es salaam it's no like why how can i take the court how how am i affected ni kwa salaam huku and there are some communities in a certain district who are affected them. I want to, to open a case on them for behalf. Now, the Rebecca Kiyumi, they were going to Ulisa, and the Ulisa, they were going to affect you. 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 How are you affected? And they were going to prove the case. Now, they were going to affect you. 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 Which sometimes is very difficult. Which is very difficult. What are you going to do? kuna watu ambao ndio wana ndani amesisitiza hata kusoma zile decision ya ya ni kwa 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 kuna watu wao wanaweza kawa wana wanafikiria sababu ya kwenda mahakamani lakini hawawezi kwa access court kuna fear kuna capacity kuna knowledge mtu ndiye anasema yani mimi kaishtaki serikali wewe ndio mtukua mtu kujini kule anaanza how can i go lakini wewe unaweza una kwa sababu you know the constitution you know the law unaweza ukastand on behalf of them ndio maana tunasema sasa ni muhimu turudi kule kule Vigilevu itakuwa mbumu sana kwa mbezi kesi. Luketi. Asante. I just want to congratulate you for your patience and for your eagerness to get knowledge. We are winding up and I would like to welcome uh, your Vice President of the Law School of Tanzania, uh, Mr. Karimu Soliambingu, for some closing remarks. Dear respected um, speakers, program coordinators, um, land advocates, advocate candidates, and all media representatives in this room, good evening. I myself, on behalf of the President of uh, Tanzania Students Bar Association, TASPA, and uh, the students of Law School of Tanzania, in general, would like to extend this heartfelt honor and the gratitude to the coordinators of this platform. It was an job. Uh, the coordinators from THRDC, the Tanzania Human Rights Defenders Coalition, in collaboration with the American Bar Association. We thank you very much. It was Hana for sure to have this opportunity and the platform passing through the subject on public interest litigation. We wish to still have you on some other times. Thank you very much.